Hello, everybody. My, my name's Mike Tipton, and I'm from the Extreme Environments Laboratory at the University of Portsmouth, where we investigate human responses to lots of different extreme environments. And the primary one for me has been cold water immersion over the years. So for about 30 or 40 years now, we've looked into the physiological and pathophysiological responses to immersion. And then our results have fed into the policies of groups like the RNLI, the Surf Life Saving GP, the Coast Guard, RLSS, and many of the other organizations who do such excellent work to try and keep people safe uh, in the water. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those responses and how you can keep yourself safe going into the water uh, in the months to come. I've got a few slides just to help me uh, do that. And I'm going to concentrate on the responses in the first couple of minutes of immersion, <clears throat> because these are the most dangerous responses of all of those associated with immersion in cold water. And, you know, in these strange times of pandemic with COVID-19, um, sadly, causing problems all around the world, uh, we shouldn't forget that there are other pandemics as well, which uh, haven't stopped. So we're still losing about a thousand people every day to drowning, a couple um, every three minutes, 41 people per hour. And this is mostly young people, quite a lot of them in the third world. And the loss of potential that that represents is absolutely um, tragic. In the UK, we lose somebody around about every 20 hours, a child a week. And <clears throat> as I say, there are many excellent organizations trying to um, prevent these deaths and trying to make sure that those who get into trouble are rescued and resuscitated appropriately. And our work has fed into a lot of those policies. So my dear friend and colleague, Frank Golden, many years ago identified four stages of immersion associated with particular risk, and the initial responses to cold water immersion, which we called cold shock back in the 1980s, not because of anything medical in terms of shock, but because it's a shocking experience to suddenly go into cold water. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The next problems come from superficial nerve and muscle cooling, particularly in the arms, because that prevents you being able to help yourself. You'll very quickly become incapacitated, lose the ability to grip things, to um, maneuver things with your hands and manipulate things. Hypothermia, historically, going right back to the Titanic, has been regarded by many to be the primary problem with going into cold water. And you'll still, to this day, see in news articles and on the TV people saying, oh, they became hypothermic within four minutes. That's just a physical um, possibility. We're just, the adult human is just too large an animal to cool that much in such a short period of time. And nobody becomes hypothermic um, within 30 minutes. So those deaths that you see uh, in less time than that are going to be caused by the two responses we see above, initial and short-term responses. And finally, about 20% of those that die do so around about the time of rescue. And there's some important lessons there for those involved in rescuing individuals. But we're going to focus on the cold shock response. And um, there it is. Now, you don't have to know anything about science or you don't have to know anything about graphs or figures to see that at the bottom of this particular slide on the right here, the pre-immersion data, the individual is okay. I mean, he's a little bit excited. He's got a resting heart rate. This is a young, fit, healthy person with a resting heart rate of about 96, per minute, 96 beats per minute. And that's because they know that they're about to go into 20,000 litres of water at around about 12 degrees Celsius. And when that happens, they go in very slowly. Um, just sitting still, you see this enormous respiratory and cardiac response. So breathing at 66 breaths per minute, shifting 114 liters in and out of the lung. End tidal CO2 is falling, showing this is a, a hyperventilation, an uncontrollable respiratory response. And the heart rate's now gone up to around about 156 beats per minute. That's the same as you would see in somebody running um, reasonably fast. But this is somebody sitting still. So this is a, um, a pretty significant threat and stress to the body. And the body responds with this fight or flight response. 
And that response is driven by sudden fall of the skin receptors, which are about 0.18 meters, millimeters below the surface of the skin. And you can see on the left here that dynamic response that you get from these receptors when you cool them that drives the cold shock response. <clears throat> Let's um, show you a short clip of video of that. This is somebody going into water. Uh, he's wearing heavy normal clothing. Uh, the water is about um, 10 degrees Celsius and he's trying to hold his breath for as long as he possibly can. What does he manage? About five seconds. And there you can see the uncontrollable hyperventilation caused by that cold shock response. There are those responses tabulated before you go into water. Um, okay, not too bad, a little bit excited as I say, but now you see on immersion, heart rate 156 beats per minute and shifting 114 liters of air uncontrollably out of, in and out of the lung. The lethal dose of water in the lung for an average adult individual, salt water, is around about 1.5 liters. The initial gasp that you see with the cold shock response, that <gasps> like this, is between two or three liters. So the very first breath that is um, caused by cold shock when you go into cold water can cross the lethal dose for drowning. You don't have to be under the water. It could be just a wave um, happening to break across your face at, the, your at that particular time. That loss of control of breathing, um, we now regard as the most dangerous of the responses associated with immersion in cold water and probably accounts for the vast majority of the deaths we see in cold water um, annually. So there's a summary of the cold shock response. <clears throat> For um, the normal um, fit, healthy individuals, the respiratory response represents, as I say, the greatest threat. You've got a gasp response, that's the most dangerous response that decreases your breath hold time to a matter of uh, seconds. Then there's a big inspiratory shift. You take a big breath in and you're now breathing right at the top of your lung, uh, which is uncomfortable. And the hyperventilation eventually um, changes the biochemistry of the body and stops you being able to use your fingers properly to assist in your self-rescue. For people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease or hypertension or aneurysms, that sudden increase in the work of the heart as the body shuts down the blood flow to the skin and pushes up the cardiac output can itself cause cardiac problems. So what can you do about it? <clears throat> well, this around about May, June is the most dangerous time of the year because the air temperature goes up very quickly, uh, but the water temperature stays low. It's now the beginning of June and the water temperature around the British Isles will be between 10 and 13 degrees Celsius. We know that that cold shock response peaks at around somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees Celsius. So it's absolutely prime territory um, for the cold shock response. So if you don't intend to go into the water, make sure you don't. So don't fall in, don't take risks, don't do um, stupid things. Often that follows people drinking in the summer. <clears throat> if you're gonna to go to a beach, go to a beach that has lifeguards and swim between the flags. So somebody's keeping an eye on you. Make sure somebody else is with you. Now, the cold shock response um, is greater the faster the skin temperature changes and the larger the surface area exposed. So go into the water slowly. Don't go running and diving off a jetty and suddenly find that you've lost control of your breathing and put an enormous strain on your heart. As the year goes on, and if you're going into cold water regularly, two things will happen. Firstly, the water get, will get warmer. It gets to its warmest about September. And secondly, you'll begin to get used to the water. You can habituate the cold shock response. So you'll notice it gets easier and easier. That phrase that we all hear, um, it's okay when you're in, is essentially directly related to the cold shock response. Any protective clothing you can wear, specialist protective clothing is good. Normal clothing doesn't do very much for you. But if you've got a wetsuit, if you're going to go into the water and you can afford a wetsuit and to use a wetsuit, that's going to decrease the cold shock response. And of course, if any of you are in a situation where a life jacket should be worn, you should wear it. This is an essential piece of life-saving equipment. And far too many people are dying because they're not wearing life jackets when they should be. 
I just want to draw attention to one more thing, and that's <clears throat> you see a large cold shock response on immersion, but those cold receptors very quickly um, adapt to that temperature. And so five minutes into the immersion, you see a much lower respiratory response. And that's a respiratory response that you can now control. You can add a breath hold on top of that. And that adaptation takes around about one to two minutes. So another very good idea when you first go into water, um, if you've suddenly fallen in or you've got into a situation where you've provoked the cold shock response, is to just stay still, just float, do as little as possible to um, until you get your breathing back under control. Because if you start thrashing about and swimming, the chances of getting water in your airway are significantly increased. Now, people tell me, oh, it's not possible to float. I can't flow. I wear clothes. They drag me down. They don't. Clothing certainly impede your swimming ability, but if you stay still, the air trapped in the clothing will help you float. And if you've got no clothes on, the vast majority of people just wearing a swimming costume um, are positively buoyant and will float. So just if you're experiencing cold shock, stay still, keep your airway clear of the water until you're able to breath hold. And that will make a significant difference to your survival prospects. So we now add to the list of things that you can protect yourself with in terms of cold shock to don't swim immediately, float first, rest and recover. Um, that concludes my very short presentation on the cold shock response. Um, do enjoy the water um, over this summer, um, but please just remember, just knowledge of these responses and how to reduce and mitigate them will mean that you stay much safer. Thank you very much.